In a world of uncertainty, unsolved mysteries often haunt us for years. From long lost siblings to missing persons, there are some cases that remain eerie and unresolved with no closure in sight. But in 2023, several cold cases were miraculously solved by dedicated police and private investigators, providing much needed resolution to heartbroken families. Join us as we take you through 2023's most bizarre, mysterious, and horrifying stories of cold cases that eventually found some form of closure. The Case of Amor Wiggins On January 28, 2012, in Opelika, Alabama, a local stumbled upon a human skull near the Brookhaven trailer park on her street. After further inspection of the area, police officers discovered that there were more skeletal remains scattered about. Furthermore, a pink, long-sleeved shirt with heart-shaped buttons was located just off the creek bank. Police could not determine if this garment belonged to the victim. Detectives concluded that the skull likely belonged to a young African-American girl between four and seven years old. A deformity in her left eye indicated she may have been abused, while her bones revealed signs of malnourishment and neglect. Utilizing the help of forensic artistry, an image of what the girl may have looked like was unveiled. Despite reviewing school and birth records, detectives were unable to uncover any information on her identity. Therefore, she became known as the Opelika Jane Doe. Four years later, in 2016, a Bible school teacher from the Greater Peace Church which was located only 10 minutes away from where the remains were discovered, uncovered photographs of a little girl who bore a striking resemblance to the Opelika Jane Doe. The teacher told police that the girl's pictures were taken in the summer of 2011 and recalled that the girl had disheveled hair, was not very hygienic, and seemed reclusive or unable to communicate with other kids. The little girl was between four and five years old at the time. The teacher could not recall her name, and the church at which she attended had failed to register any of its children, leaving no traceable records. Working with what they've got, police used advanced imaging software to enhance the old photo as much as possible, hoping that a member of the public would help them identify the Opelika Jane Doe. Then, in 2017, experts from the University of South Florida's Institute for Forensic Anthropology performed a series of isotope tests on her bones and came to the conclusion that she probably lived in the southeastern parts of the United States. In January 2022, the help of Othram Laboratories was employed by the Opelika Police Department. Othram is an advanced forensic sequencing lab built to apply the power of modern parallel sequencing to forensic evidence. Her remains were sent to Othram's laboratory a DNA extract from these remains was then synthesized, which facilitated the creation of a more comprehensive genealogical profile. Taking matters further, the Opelika Police Department sought out the help of Barbara Ray Ventor, a renowned geneticist who is mostly known for aiding police investigations with identifying the Golden State Killer to supply investigative leads. In January 2023, Othram was finally able to uncover the identity of the Opelika Jane Doe. She was a little girl by the name of Amor Jovea Wiggins. Amor's father was known as Lamar Vickerstaff, a 50-year-old native of Opelika. Lamar was serving in the U.S. Navy. Prior to the Discovery's announcements, detectives journeyed to the Mayport Naval Station in Jacksonville, where Lamar was stationed at the time, and confronted him about his daughter's passing. Lamar refused to cooperate. When questioned about the girl's remains, Ruth, Lamar's wife, to whom he'd been married since May 2006, informed detectives that she had no idea who she was or who her real mother might have been. It was later discovered that Amor's real mother was Sherry Wiggins, who hailed from Maryland. Sherry met Lamar Vickerstaff when she was only 19. Lamar was 35 and serving in the Navy at the time. The two lived in the same apartment complex. Soon after, they decided to take the next step 
and move in together when Sherry discovered her pregnancy. Despite this, Lamar's family was deeply angered by the fact that their son had a child out of wedlock. So the couple agreed to split up after coming to the realization that getting married wouldn't be feasible. At the age of 37, Sherry told detectives that she was indeed a Moore's biological mother. She confirmed that Lamar and Ruth had received full legal custody over Moore back in 2009, that Sherry was paying child support to Lamar since then, and that her visitation rights were suspended at the time of Amor's death. Lamar and Ruth were apprehended in Jacksonville, Florida on January 17, 2023. They are currently being detained at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and are both charged with failure to report a missing child. In addition to these charges, Lamar is also facing a felony murder charge. Sherry, Amor's real mother, spoke out publicly expressing her feelings on the community's reaction to her daughter's case. She stated that although some have been kind and understanding of her situation, many were quick to pass judgment on her without any knowledge of what truly happened. Despite this, Sherry said the only thing she was worried about was getting justice for more. She extended an immense amount of gratitude towards the Opelika Police Department, who never gave up on finding her missing child. The Case of Deanna Denise Howland On the spring day of May 2004, 35-year-old Deanna Denise Howland vanished without a trace. Deanna hailed from Alton, Illinois. She was a mother of four, yet most of her children never knew her. Deanna's life leading up to her mysterious vanishing was troubled, to say the least. For years, she endured a drug addiction that caused her lifestyle to be unsettled and unpredictable. Nevertheless, one of her daughters noticed something was amiss when Deanna neglected to appear for a school play she had promised her to attend in May 2004. Then, on a fateful day in June of 2004, maintenance workers at the rest stop off Interstate 70 discovered a human body, which had been discarded down a grassy incline. The body belonged to a woman, yet some parts of her were missing. All she had on was a black bra. The lack of decomposition suggested that her death had likely been recent. Moreover, a sharp blade was found in a nearby sewer, having been discarded at the scene of the crime. Investigators tried identifying the body using what little evidence they had available to them, such as a C-section scar, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. As for who was responsible for the murder, there was only one clue. Witnesses reported that they saw a white utility van parked in the vicinity of the crime scene 24 hours prior to the discovery of the torso. With no fresh leads to go by, and with no way of figuring out the woman's identity at the time, her case went cold. Then, 12 years later, in 2016, advanced DNA testing revealed that the mysterious Jane Doe was, in fact, Deanna Howland. Subsequently, using this same technology, police were also able to discover the identity of her murderer by testing the knife which was left at the scene of the crime. It was a man by the name of Mike Clardy. Mike was apprehended in Maryland Heights at the residence he shared with his spouse. It turns out, following Deanna's murder, Mike had had a car accident that rendered him blind. Mike Clardy confessed to murdering Deanna in his home and moving her body to where it was eventually found. He mentioned that he met Deanna while she was working on the street and that his reasons for killing her in such a horrific manner were all because of a disagreement. If found guilty, he is facing up to 40 years in prison for his crime. The Case of Noelle Renee Trice and Brian Keith Lash it was the morning hours of August 11, 2017, when someone stumbled upon the lifeless bodies of Noelle Renee Trice and Brian Keith Lashley in their Fort Wayne, Indiana home. Noelle was born on June 28, 1991. Brian, on the other hand, was born on the 7th of July in 1987. They were 25 and 29 years old, respectively. Officers immediately responded to the scene 
and found blood splattered throughout the residence. Investigators were able to determine that a party had taken place at the couple's home earlier that night after questioning family members and guests who attended. Police began analyzing the scene of the crime. Law enforcement personnel carefully examined Noelle's phone, discovered in the hallway for any fingerprints. Unsurprisingly, Noelle's fingerprints were found all over the phone, but surprisingly, another unknown fingerprint was also discovered. Detectives worked tirelessly to find a match for the mysterious fingerprint. Initially, they suspected it may have belonged to Brian, but after running through it their database, they soon discovered that the fingerprint belonged to Dustin Neal, an old acquaintance of the couple. When questioned, Dustin revealed that he had known Noelle for about 20 years, that he had gone straight to his mother's house right after the party, and, perhaps most intriguing of all, that he was aware of the couple's possession of three pounds of marijuana, which, according to Dustin himself, was worth a lot of money. With no evidence against him, Dustin was allowed to go home, and it seemed as though Noelle and Brian's murderer would never be found. But then, a person was tracked down who had spoken to Dustin around the time of the murders, unraveling an even bigger mystery. This individual revealed that Dustin contacted him on 10th of June, 2017. Dustin sounded on edge and claimed he had a large quantity of marijuana up for sale. In July 2022, another witness alerted police that Dustin Neal's half-brother had told him his brother was responsible for what happened to Noelle and Brian. Investigating further, authorities spoke with the half-brother in October of that same year, who confessed to hearing Dustin bragging about killing both Noelle and Brian. In October of 2022, yet another witness came forward, this time claiming that Dustin had told them that he was responsible for the deaths of Noelle, Brian, and five other people. During that same month, police analyzed Dustin's cell phone, and they discovered that his cell phone signals would have placed him at the scene of the crime between 6.20 a.m. and 7.04 a.m. With so much evidence now in the police possession, the truth was finally revealed. In an ill-conceived attempt to steal some marijuana, Neil entered the couple's home through a window, believing nobody was there. Unfortunately, he was then spotted by Brian. Unsure what to do, Neil lunged at Brian with the knife and murdered him. He then went on to do the same thing to Noelle. On January 1st of 2023, Fort Wayne Police Department and the Allen County Sheriff's Department charged and arrested 35-year-old Neil in Wales County. Dustin will soon be extradited to Allen County, where he will be charged with the murder of Noelle Renee Trice and Brian Keith Lashley. After nearly six years since this crime was committed, justice has finally been served. The Case of Daisy Mae Tolman In 2008, an unidentified female skeletal remains were discovered west of White Swan. The Akima coroner's office explored all leads available to try and identify her, but had no luck with traditional DNA testing, as the bones did not provide an accurate DNA profile. With every lead run dry and no DNA results in hand, this case soon faded into obscurity. Then, in 2022, the Yakima County coroner's office and Othram joined forces to utilize advanced DNA testing with the aim of identifying this unknown woman. The skeletal remains were sent to Othram, where scientists were able to finally obtain a usable extract from them. Subsequently, the lab employed forensic-grade genome sequencing to construct a complete DNA profile. The Yakima County Coroner's Office conducted an investigation and provided a familiar reference DNA sample. Altham relied on state-of-the-art familiar testing technology to confirm the supposed connection between the reference sample and the unknown female's genetic material. After a thorough investigation, it was confirmed that the unidentified female was Daisy May Tallman, otherwise known as Daisy May Heath. She was born on 10th of January, 1958. 
Described by those who were fortunate enough to know her, Daisy was a lively and courageous young girl with an introverted personality. She treasured her kin and the old-fashioned lifestyle, never shying away from lending a hand whenever needed. Her missing persons report revealed that she had been residing with relatives in the Yakima Indian Reservation when she went missing. Later, her backpack and keys were discovered at a secluded locale called Soda Springs within the reservation's territory. Daisy disappeared during the last days of August 1987 and was not reported missing by her family until late October. The reason her family waited two full months before reporting her missing was that she had a habit of disappearing for days, sometimes even weeks at a time. Daisy was 29 years old at the time of her death. The exact circumstances of her passing remain unknown. The Case of Wilhelmina Filkins 81-year-old Wilhelmina Violet Filkins was a resident of East Greenbush, New York. She loved life and spent the years following her retirement tending to her garden and doing volunteer work. Violet lived in East Greenbush for 60 years, but grew up in the neighboring town of Rensselaer, alongside nine other siblings. She was never married and lived alone. On the 19th of August, 1994, Violet's brother and niece arrived at her apartment blissfully unaware of what they were about to witness. Though her car, a 1989 Plymouth Reliant, was parked in her normal spot at the multi-building complex, the two noticed that it was parked in an unusual way, not at all how Violet typically parks. Intrigued, the two ventured inside the building complex. As soon as they went inside Violet's home, they were met with a grisly sight. It was their beloved sibling, not full of vibrancy as usual, but instead lying lifelessly on her apartment floor. An autopsy later revealed that Violet had been assaulted two days prior to the discovery of her body. The cause of death was determined to be trauma to the head. Law enforcement officers theorized that Violet's assailant likely confronted her during a robbery, and this hypothesis became more readily apparent after it was discovered that her car had been stolen, only to be returned on the very same day, which explains the unusual way it was parked when her brother and sister saw it. Three years later, some of Violet's possessions were also discovered near the Nassau Shodak Cemetery in the village of Nassau, 10 miles southeast of her apartment complex. In spite of the extensive number of leads pursued, investigators failed to pin down a likely suspect. Violet's case went cold as a result. In 2019, 25 years after the original incident occurred, investigators received a tip from a woman who said that her boyfriend had confessed to robbing an elderly woman before hitting her and leaving her to die. That poor old woman, I robbed her, I hit her, and I just left her there. The boyfriend's name was Jeremiah James Gouvet. He was 18 at the time the crime took place. Gouvet's name was included in police documents as having been questioned regarding the murder, but was subsequently ruled out as a potential suspect. Upon graduating from high school, Gouvet moved to Red Hook, New York, where he then enlisted in the U.S. Air Force and was assigned at Patrick Air Force Base near Cape Canaveral. After being discharged from the military, he returned home to Red Hook and eventually settled in Rosendale. Gouvet was 43 at the time and had found a job working as a bus driver for elderly seniors. When law enforcement officers arrived at Gouvet's home, on October 1, 2019, and questioned him about Violet's murder, he instantly became defensive and grew visibly agitated. Furthermore, he refused to talk to anyone without an attorney present. At the same time, police also questioned Gouvet's family members, acquaintances, and colleagues. The next day, however, Gouvet was found dead. He had taken his own life. Just before his untimely death, it was reported he contacted a family member stating that he didn't want to go to jail. Gouvet sounded terrified and distressed throughout the ominous phone call. Investigators then retrieved fingerprints and DNA from Gouvet for use as proof in the investigation. 
A comparison between Gouvet's fingerprint and another, previously unidentified fingerprint found on a wooden corner of a coffee table at the scene of the crime, revealed what investigators were already suspecting. The fingerprints were one and the same. On the 19th of January, 2023, the East Greenbush Police Department convened a press conference to announce that Jeremiah James Gouvet was the man responsible for the taking of Wilhelmina's Filkin's life. At the news conference, Wilhelmina's niece expressed great appreciation for law enforcement and remembered her aunt as a humble woman who lived peacefully and spread nothing but joy and kindness to all those around her. The Case of Dorothy Lynn Ricker On October 27, 1997, the Michigan State Police received a call about a body of an unclothed woman who had washed up on shore near Fox Farm Road in Manistee County. When they arrived at the scene, they discovered that she was already deceased for some time. At the time of discovery, the only physical identifier this woman had on her was a single earring. An autopsy later revealed that her death was due to asphyxia via drowning and determined it was probably accidental. Due to the limited technology at the time, nobody could figure out with certainty who the woman was. But in September 2020, the Michigan State Police Cadillac Post and Missing Persons Coordination Unit decided to reopen the investigation due to the availability of more advanced DNA testing techniques. As a result, the woman's body was exhumed and brought to a lab for further examination. Police officials sought the help of a DNA Doe project, a nonprofit that assists in providing closures for families and investigators by leveraging investigative genetic genealogy. In July 2021, a potential familiar association was identified through the use of this technology. The findings were then supplied by the DNA Doe Project to Michigan State Police, who conducted further investigations. After looking at all the evidence, authorities determined a potential link between the woman's remains and the Thing family who lived in Acton, Maine. Subsequently, Michigan State Police secured familiar DNA reference samples from a potential relative. Unfortunately, the bone samples taken from the woman's remains were not suitable for traditional testing due to their deteriorated state. Therefore, they were submitted to Intermountain Forensics in Salt Lake City, Utah, and with advanced next-generation sequencing, a positive identification was reached on December 2022. The remains were identified as those of Dorothy Lynn Ricker, a 26-year-old woman who had been living in Chicago before she vanished. Dorothy was last seen on October 2, 1997, at 12.30 p.m., when officers from the St. Francis Police Department in Wisconsin encountered her sitting on a beach near the lake and spoke with her. Officers recalled she told them that she was enjoying the lakefront and the sun. Dorothy wasn't registered as missing at the time, so officers didn't think much of it. Dorothy's car was found abandoned shortly after she was last seen. Whether Dorothy took her own life or whether there was some form of foul play remains a mystery to this day. The Case of Daniel G. Garza Gonzalez On March 13, 1973, a shocking discovery was made on the banks of Saginaw River in Milwaukee, Michigan. A man's body had been unceremoniously cast out into the waters. Autopsy reports showed that he had sustained multiple gunshot wounds and injuries caused by blunt force trauma. It appeared someone had hit him on the back of his head before shooting and throwing away his body, leaving behind no trace. With no clues as to whom the culprit could be, authorities laid the man's body in an unmarked grave and the case went cold for almost 50 years. However, in 2020, the Michigan State Police cold case team and their missing persons coordination unit reopened the case. They exhumed the body for advanced DNA testing and sent a bone sample to Australia Forensics for forensics genetic genealogy. In late 2021, with help from the nonprofit DNA Doe Project, Inc., they identified a possible familiar match. 
With collaboration between the Texas Rangers and the DNA Doe Project, they were able to link the remains to a family in Beeville, Texas, and obtain familiar DNA reference samples, which were sent to an FBI lab for comparison. On January 5th of 2023, it was announced that the John Doe in question had been identified as Vietnam War veteran Daniel G. Garza Gonzalez, who was only 28 years old at the time of his disappearance. Following his return to America, he had left Fort Worth, Texas in search of work in Flint, Michigan, but never made it there or back home again. Daniel's killer remains unknown. The Michigan State Police Cold Case Team and Missing Persons Coordination Unit is still calling for anyone with information on Daniel's case to come forward. The Case of Lillian DeClo. 89 years old, Lillian DeClo was a former teacher and nurse who lived in Broward County in 1994. She suffered from memory loss and needed assistance with day-to-day activities. Her niece, June Nicholas, took care of her. On the afternoon of April 29, 1994, June entered her aunt's home only to find Lillian had been murdered. It appeared as though the assailant had gotten into the house through a bedroom window and ransacked the place, indicating it was likely not a targeted attack, but rather a robbery gone wrong. In an effort to gather more information, the police diligently collected various objects from the crime scene as evidence. Years later, in 2004, detectives at Broward County Sheriff's Office retested Lillian's nightgown and discovered male DNA on it. Hoping to solve the case, Broward County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit reopened the investigation in 2019. They examined previous records and DNA databases, combing them for any potential leads that may have missed. In the end, they found a likely suspect, a homeless man by the name of Johnny Mac Brown. Johnny Mac Brown was a former United States Marine who once lived just down the street from Lillian. His family members shared with detectives that he had been suffering from substance abuse and PTSD for a number of years, something which eventually led up to his death in 2010. In August 2022, investigators obtained a court order to unearth Brown's remains from the South Florida National Cemetery in Palm Beach County. Tests conducted by the Broward County Sheriff's Office Crime Lab revealed that Brown's DNA was a direct match with the DNA left on Lillian's nightgown. The truth was finally revealed. Johnny Mac Brown was responsible for what happened to Lillian. Lillian's case was now solved. When June Nicholas found out who her aunt killers was, she had this to say, I know that wherever she is, she can sleep in peace. The Case of Philip Kahn On July 24, 2000, an unidentified male body was discovered floating in the Atlantic Ocean, 27 miles off the coast of Maine, near the Grand Manan Banks. In an effort to identify this man, the Maine Office of Chief Medical Examiner performed an autopsy and took DNA and fingerprint samples. The samples were submitted to the FBI, yet no matches were found. Despite their best efforts, no new leads were unearthed by the police and the case went cold. In 2019, the main office of Chief Medical Examiner enlisted the help of Parabon Nanolabs to evaluate the DNA and attempt forensic genealogy, hoping to uncover any potential leads. Unfortunately, their efforts yielded no tangible results. In March 2022, the main office of Chief Medical Examiner held a meeting with representatives from the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services to discuss modernized technologies available through their organization. The unidentified man's fingerprints and dental records were sent for analysis in May 2022. After review by DPI services and further examination at the FBI, it was determined that the remains belonged to 84-year-old Philip Kahn, who had gone missing in Las Vegas in 2000. One of Philip's family members was notified of the disturbing finding. Philip had left Las Vegas, Nevada in July 2020 and landed in New York. How his body ended up off the coast of Maine 
is a puzzle yet to be solved. The Case of William and Ina Campbell William and Ina Campbell were a loving elderly couple, both in their 80s, who lived on Jackson Road, Clarksville, Tennessee. During a heavy snowstorm in 2010, the couple's mailbox was struck by an unfortunate neighbor driving on the slippery roads. The neighbor tried calling several times, but William Campbell was not answering his phone, so the neighbor tried calling Daniel Champagne. Daniel was also their neighbor, but was very close to the Campbells. In fact, the Campbells thought of him as a son and even entrusted him with a spare set of keys to their house. Daniel attempted to reach out to the couple, yet there was no response. With no other option, he felt that he had no other recourse but to use the key he'd been given to gain entrance into their home and check if everything was okay. When he entered the house, he was greeted by an appalling sight. William and Ina Campbell lay on their beds. They had been murdered in their sleep. As they aged, the Campbells endured a few medical issues which necessitated them sleeping in separate beds. When Daniel discovered Ina, she still had her oxygen tube attached to her nose. After the shock wore out and he slowly began grasping the reality of what he saw, Daniel looked around him and noticed that the drawers were all ripped apart and all of the kitchen cupboards were left hanging open, indicating that the place had been ransacked. What was most peculiar of all is that none of the Campbell's guns were taken. According to the Clarksville police detective, Tim Anderson, guns are the number one thing that gets stolen during a robbery. Immediately, Daniel informed the police, who promptly arrived on the scene and began analyzing all the evidence. Some of the neighbors were questioned and recalled that the dogs never barked. This was strange, as the Campbell's dogs definitely would bark if a stranger walked inside the home unannounced. This led officers to surmise that it was someone who was well acquainted with the victims and their dogs who had committed the crime. What investigators found most bizarre was that no items of value were taken, jewelry boxes remained untouched, the safe had not been tampered with, and all of the money the Campbells had lying around was still there when police arrived. All of this led officers to conclude that the person behind the crime must have had ulterior motives, that he stood to gain something more substantial than a few pieces of expensive jewelry and a few hundred dollars. Their adopted son, William Roger Campbell, immediately became a person of interest as he was next in line to inherit their estate if they were to pass away. Bill Campbell's estate was valued at $130,000 and Ina's estate was worth approximately $120,000. Investigators also recalled that Roger refused to cooperate with them fully and even provided several inconsistencies during questioning. Furthermore, he was declared the last known person to see his parents alive. Despite all of that, at the time, there wasn't enough evidence linking him to the scene of the crime. As time passed and leads ran thin, interest in the case slowly fizzled out. Then 11 years later, on June 21, 2021, Roger Campbell was apprehended at his home by deputies from the Laudes County Sheriff's Office in what must have been an unexpected turn of events for him and extradited to Clarksville. His bond was set at $500,000. He was charged with the murder of his adoptive parents, but Roger maintained his innocence, pleading not guilty to two counts of first-degree murder. What he failed to take into consideration was that detectives were hard at work gathering up all the evidence necessary for constructing a solid case against him. His trial began on January 2023. During the trial, prosecutors showcased what detectives have managed to unearth throughout the years, and Rogers' prospects for a not guilty verdict slowly began diminishing. It was revealed that only a few days after the Campbell's remains were found, law enforcement officers traveled to Georgia in order to question him, and in his truck, they noticed an ominously red-stained sheet tucked away beneath one of its seats. Although testing could not determine whether or not it was actually blood, detectives also discovered traces of Roger's blood found on the surface of a dish soap bottle near the kitchen sink. 
His upstairs bathroom sink drain was also looked at and it tested positive for blood. Roger Campbell's ex-wife and son both took to the stand and testified against him. William Sean Campbell, the 35-year-old son of Roger Campbell, fondly remembered having a close bond with his late grandparents. As for his father, he only saw him on very rare occasions throughout his childhood. I've been on this earth 35 years, and in that 35 years, I've spent less than 24 hours around him. Sean Campbell also revealed that shortly after his grandparents' funeral, he learned of an estate auction taking place at their residence. He felt betrayed because his father never reached out to him about keeping any mementos from his grandparents. As for 70-year-old Linda Campbell, Roger's former spouse, she testified in court that three days before the Campbells were discovered dead, she worked at the commissary and was paged to register 17, only to see Roger there alongside one of his would-be victims, his mother, Ina Campbell. Before then, Linda hadn't seen or even spoken to Roger for 13 years. He seemed a bit too eager to strike up a conversation with her, only to cut it short after making it explicitly clear that he was only in town for a short while and will be leaving on the 28th of January, which, as fate would have it, was the very same day the Campbells met their gruesome fate. I thought, why do I care when you're leaving? It seemed as if Roger's real motive was to devise an alibi. After examining the crime scene, detectives uncovered two 25 caliber shell casings in the victim's room that were linked to one particular firearm. Interestingly enough, only one casing matched a box of ammunition found at the site. The box belonged to the late Bill Campbell. According to Andrew Smith, the proprietor of It's Time Clock Shop, the Campbells owned a very rare Linscritch grandfather clock. Smith testified that he had been regularly maintaining the Campbell's clock for several years, visiting their residence yearly to make repairs. When Smith saw the clock, he offered Bill Campbell $5,000 for it, as fate would have it, in front of Roger. Bill, however, knew the timepiece was a prized antique, so he refused to part with it. Smith recalled that, in the days following the tragedy, he received a phone call inquiring if he was still interested in purchasing the Lynn's Critch grandfather clock. Excitedly, he agreed and was given directions on where to go and inspect it. When Smith got to the Campbell's household, he let the courtroom know how thrilled he was to finally be able to purchase the clock. Unfortunately, instead of his frequent patrons, it was Roger, their adopted son, who greeted him. I said, where's your mom and dad? He seemed nervous, shaky, and said, Didn't you hear? Mom and dad were shot and killed in the bedrooms. Without hesitation, Smith attempted to put a halt to the sale. However, Roger tried reassuring him, insisting that he was their only heir and that he can do whatever he pleased with his parents' belongings. Smith was eventually convinced and decided to go ahead with the transaction. What Smith found most bizarre was that Roger seemed overly unfazed by his parents' brutal demise as he tried his luck by bargaining for 6000 instead of 5000 an attempt that ultimately failed. In the end, Roger agreed to part with his father's clock for only $5,000. Roger's previous testimony also came back to haunt him. He reported to detectives that he had left his parents' home at about 7 a.m. on January 28, 2010, noting that they were still wearing their nightwear when he set off. Forensic specialists determined the time of death was somewhere around 6.20 a.m. prior to Roger's departure from the premises. All in all, prosecutors argued that Roger Campbell was clearly a man influenced by greed. They showcased just how much Roger had financially profited from the crime. They weren't dying fast enough, said Assistant District Attorney Crystal Morgan. That's why he killed them. He needed money, and they weren't dying quick enough. On January 23, 2023, 66-year-old William Roger Campbell was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder. Despite the unfortunate presence of hatred and greed in our world, justice is still within reach. Thanks to modern technologies and innovative investigation methods, the truth can now be uncovered 
more easily than ever before. As long as kindness and determination persist, we will thankfully always have a fighting chance of finding it.